Hi, um, it's Amy Shaw here. It's um, February 25th, 2016. And um, it's a beautiful day here. Um, I'm in uh, Westlake, which is west of Austin in the hills a little bit. And um, there's a, I'm in the parking lot again, my son's appointment. Um, there's a busy street behind me. So um, I'm afraid the the noise is going to be too much, so I'm going to go in my car in a little bit. But um, I wanted to show you this amazing tree that's here in this parking lot. Um, so I'm going to spin around. You can see some of it behind me, and um, that's how far it branches up. But um, here, it's um, there, and it goes all the way up. Its branches go all the way out. gorgeous, beautiful tree. And next to her, about there, is another um, really pretty tree. So I like to come out a little bit and spend some time out here with them. They're beautiful, but we'll see you back in my car in a minute. Okay, um, I'm back in my car. It just seems the easiest um, for me to record this way, so I'm going to keep trying it this way. Um, what's been on my mind a lot lately and what I want to talk about today is um, this idea of codependency and unconditional love um, and how they sort of relate and um, how they're different. Um, the reason this is really on my mind um, actually is because the last couple years um, I've had a lot of people projecting onto me that you know maybe I'm codependent, that I'm enmeshed, that I'm doing things for my adult children that they could do for themselves. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about that personal stuff, um, and it's not because I'm trying to hide it, I'm just trying to cut the video down um, to make it um, palatable, um, but uh, basically I've, ha I've had, you know, um, a lot of projection onto me, you know, that, that I'm somehow doing something wrong, and that, you know, my efforts to actually help my children are um, actually harmful to them and to myself, that I'm not taking um, myself into account. And so it's really caused me to go into myself and, and really dig around a lot and think about it and, and try to make sense of it. Um, I do want to give a little bit of testimony. Um, I came out of a very, very difficult childhood. Um, I won't go into the details of that or the specific psychiatric diagnoses and whatnot that might be might have been at play for me. Um, or even the dynamics, but I will just say this, that I grew up my entire life um, basically being told that I'm selfish and self-centered, and so I learned from a very young age that to be loved, to be accepted, um, to get, um, you know, any kind of attention at all, I had to make myself, like, this small. I had to become, like, a non-person. I wasn't allowed to really express my feelings or my experiences. None of that was valid. And so um, it's not surprising then, given those type of conditions, that I learned how to be a good little codependent. And so um, by the time I was 15, I was out of control and not well. And um, I ended up marrying a 24-year-old man who was a raging alcoholic, drug addict, abusive. Um, I say that, you know, um, also wanting to give him grace that he, you know, was sick too. So he's not a bad person. I, I and but, uh, um, you know, truth be told, it, it was a very difficult marriage. Nine years I spent in it. I was physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually abused. Um, very difficult. Um, so very early on in that marriage, I came to understand that. Um, you know, something was wrong with me, that I chose this person, and don't get me wrong, I loved him, I loved him with my full heart in the fullest capacity that any 15-year-old girl coming from the place that I came from could love anybody, I mean, I was madly in love with him, I mean, really to the point that I would have laid down and, and died for him, so, but, but it, that, that's really what the problem is, right, that's what the codependency was, but Early on in the marriage, um, you know, when I was about 18, 17, 18 years old, um, I got involved with the 12-step program, um, and in particularly 
um, with uh, NA and AA, but also with um, Al-Anon, um, who is, is, that is the 12-step program for the family members of um, alcoholics and, and addicts. And so I actually brought my little books to show you. This was my Al-Anon one day at a time book right here. Um, it's dated 10, 11, 90. Um, Allen on Inland Empire. I mean, it, it was. I use this thing so much. There's not even any cover on it anymore. It's um, well used and well highlighted as well. Um, this was my life, my Bible. Um, I also have the the second one, the Courage to Change, the second one day at a time. And I they probably don't even make them like this anymore. But this is how old that is. So from really early on. Um, in my marriage, I began working on myself in terms of understanding what got me to that place and how to get myself out of that place. Um, and um, that was quite a long time ago, 1990. We're in 2016. So I've had many, 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 many years of working on these issues, developing myself, growing, and, and expanding myself as a human being. So I don't really think that... Um, Codependency is a word that I would use to describe myself today or enmeshment. Um, so really what I want to talk about today is how um, that gets confused with unconditional love and how um, a lot of people, um, you know, we're, we're kind of in this era where there, to me, in my estimation, it's almost like there's a, a, um, a bias against, um, you know, a the more feminine aspects of, of love and nurturing and unconditional regard. And, um, and you know, we live in this very uh, me, me culture that teaches us that to, you know, give of ourselves is unhealthy or it's wrong. And um, especially for women. And, and I think because women tend to have a little bit more propensity towards codependency. So we automatically assume as soon as we see a woman that's, um, uh, you know, giving more than we think she should, that she's codependent, something's wrong with her, and we pathologize it. So what really what I want to do is contrast that with uh, unconditional love. So I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and angel, of, of men of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Um, that goes on a little bit more, but that's sufficient um, to... Um, illustrate my point. Um, now, a lot of people, if you would take 1 Corinthians 13 and you hold it up to somebody that's codependent and you put the scripture right next to them and you compare the two, it's like, wow, that that's exactly describing this person. Um, so where do we come to the point where we're crossing the line between acting um, out of love, which the Bible says that God is love. So when we manifest love and we're loving people, like is described in 1 Corinthians 13, then we are embodying Christ and living Christ, which is really what we all should be doing, right? But when does it cross that line and become unhealthy? Or does it even? I mean, that's a really legitimate question. Does it? I mean, if a person's really coming from the wholeness of their selves and they're seated within themselves, then is it unhealthy um, to demonstrate that type of love, even if somebody is quote unquote abusive? I mean, the thing of it is, is that I've come to a place in my own journey where I've learned that you, if you're a victim, it's because you're identifying yourself as a victim. 
You know, if you're martyring yourself, it's because you are choosing to do that. You know, now, don't get me wrong, please. I'm not saying, like, oh, if you're in an abusive relationship, just change your reality. You're not really being abused. You know, stay in it and just change your reality. I'm not, I'm not even trying remotely to suggest that. Um, as a matter of fact, here's another thing I wanted to share really quick. Um, I wrote this book, Family Abuse in the Bible, The Scriptural Perspective, um, a long time ago. This was like my other life when I really was a Christian, and um, this was my framework for how I viewed reality. Um, I wrote it because uh, I was working with women, and I myself was in an abusive relationship, and so I could relate to a lot of the justifications and reasons that they had for not leaving and getting out of the relationship. And a lot of it was sort of spun out into this spiritual theological paradigm, um, which was actually, um, I came to understand in my own life, a lack of faith, right? I, I, I was clinging on to a belief system and it was my lack of faith that was actually keeping me in the relationship, right? So for me, getting out, it was truly like God parting the Red Sea, right? And calling his people out of the slavery of Egypt and into the promised land. That's really what it was like for me getting out of my abusive um, relationship. So I'm not trying to say that at all, like, you know, that you should stay in it or you should long suffer it or that's love. No, please, completely the opposite is what I'm saying. But what I am telling you is that I've come out of that and I've healed myself and I've come to a place of understanding that I am in my power. Uh, I think the difference for me before, um, I because I had learned to be so small, that I had learned to be nothing, to be nobody, that it wasn't okay to receive love and acceptance. I had to be nothing. And so um, my choices early on in my life were coming out of that wounding, which is actually an ego projection, right, of a, a wounding. And I really literally would have cut my wrists and just bled out for anybody and everybody that asked me to do that in return uh, for um, attention, love, you know, somebody saying that they loved me, that they appreciated me or valued me, I would do it, do it. Um, so, um, you know, uh, what's different for me now is that, of course, I wouldn't do something like that. Now, does that mean that I wouldn't do that? I guess what I'm saying is I, I would still do that. I would still sacrifice my life in love for somebody but not out of a sense of getting, gaining worth or purpose or neediness or from the ego projection. You know, today I'm much more rooted in myself and it comes more from that, a place of knowing who I am and making a choice to freely love. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I was um, thinking this week about... Um, Sorry, there's like a ton of distractions. It's so busy today here. Um, anyway, I was thinking this week about times in my life when I really felt like I was authentic and in my full power. And what I kept coming back to my role as a mother and thinking about all those times when I have been able to love my children unconditionally. And I don't really think that that's codependent or enmeshment or unhealthy. I think that for me, and, it, and it, it's not even to where I can look in the mirror and say, this is my worth. This is who I am. You know, I am a mother. Uh, I'm much more than that. But the fact that I was able to give that to my children in a world that denies that to them, um, it makes me feel powerful. You know, like I am here to do the work of God, um, as a mother, as a wife, as a friend, you know, as all these things, but can it extend beyond that, you know, into the realm of um, loving strangers like that? Um, my daughter, she's, um, you know, about to be 24, and she shared a story with me recently. Um, she lives in the L.A. area, and um, she went to UCLA, and part of her um, clinical nursing experience there was to do work on Skid Row with the homeless people providing medical assessment and care. And so she's a little bit of exposure um, with that population. Um, she graduated and she's been working on her own for well over a year now. And um, the other day she went into a fast food restaurant. She saw a homeless man who was outside um, um, 
and she invited him in to get something to eat. So she bought him food, and you know, um, it was awkward to buy him food and then have him sitting on the opposite end of the restaurant eating, right? Um, so she invited him to sit at her table, and she was talking about, you know, the conversation and just actually how shocked he was that he was just looking at her just the whole entire time and staring at her, like, almost in disbelief. And, you know, at one point even asked her, like, who are you? You know, and I, because we live in this culture where people aren't kind to each other, you know, and homeless people are like the lepers of our society, right? We're taught to fear them, to be afraid of them, that something's wrong with them. Maybe they're mentally ill or maybe they've committed a crime or maybe they're, you know, something about them. We don't even know that we're terrified. And so it makes it hard to approach them. Or we think that, oh, you know, they're just addicts and, and, you know, they, they're trying to get over on me to get my money or to get this or to get that, I, you know. And there are people that think this. Like, well, if I give that bum a dollar, he's just going to go buy a beer, right? Or he's just going to, you know, whatever. Um, there are people that think that. And, and that might be uh, true. Um, but this goes back to what I'm saying about um, victimization. Is that we cannot be victimized unless we co-sign that reality. If I want to give a homeless man five bucks... And I think, oh, he victimized me because he took my five bucks and he went and bought drugs with it. No, I'm freely giving it from my heart. At the moment that that money passes my hand into his hand, I'm free of any obligation um, to feel like he took anything from me or that I participated in any kind of way. Um, that man's going to do what that man's going to do regardless of my kindness. If it's not me, it'll be someone else or, or some other way that he finds to do whatever it is that he wants to do. So my act of kindness, because it comes from my heart, because my unconditional love for him as a human being, um, that's it. That, there's nothing else to that. That's it. Completely. Um, this kind of goes into... I'm, I, I, I'm probably going to make another video, actually, about this, about intuition and fear. But it brings up another thing that I'm thinking about. Um, I, I read a book um, several years ago by Gavin De Becker, and it was called um, The Gift of Fear. Ugh, it's just so... It's really, really busy in this parking lot today. So people are, like, pulling up all around me and sort of, like, wondering what the hell I'm doing talking to myself in my car. Anyway, so I read this book by... Um, Gavin De Becker called The Gift of Fear, and in it he talked about how particularly women were acculturated in our society to um, not be the bitch. And so what happens sometimes is um, we put ourselves in vulnerable, vulnerable situations, dangerous situations, with people, um, namely men, um, because our gut tells us this is dangerous, this is wrong, you know, but our head, because we're acculturated this way, tells us, oh, but don't be a bitch, don't be a bitch. And so we comply and, you know, we sort of put on this victim role and, and basically the thesis of the book is this, this is how women are um, victimized. So he's saying fear is a gift and that we should pay attention to it. Well, really, um, there's a distinction between an ego fear and an intuitive fear, and that's a different video. But for right now, what I want to say is that and because we don't have that distinction, we're not talking about that distinction in our society, we often respond just out of the ego fear. Um, and whether that's, you know, a fear of being victimized or, um, you know, yeah, basically a fear of being victimized, either physically or emotionally. And so we're very ego re reactive. And that actually can prevent us from um, living fully in the embodied love of Christ. So I just want to encourage you today that... Um, there is a distinction between codependency and enmeshment when you're not, you're, you're um, seeking self-worth and self-value. When you're in your ego, you're worried about other people's perceptions that, oh, they might think I'm a bitch. They might, you know, not like me if I don't comply, you know, where we're um, engaging in behaviors that actually could be harmful and aren't taking into consideration our needs and our safety. And when we're fully seated in our power and we know who we are and we cannot be victimized because we come from a place of absolutely choosing love over anything else, regardless of what, what happens. 
you see and so there's a difference and um, how that relates to intimate relationships that are abusive is much more complicated obviously um, because I've been in that situation and I know that you know um, we can convince ourselves that we are being righteous right that and, and, and all of that sort of like an ego defense too we want to see ourselves in the best possible way so it's easier to sort of stay in a relationship and think I'm long suffering it I'm you know showing unconditional love and you know I feel sorry for my abuser he's or she's unhealthy and you know, I understand and they need my help, so I'm going to continue on suffering the abuse so that I can continue to show them what love is and not be one of a string of a hundred other people that have rejected them. And, you know, so we, we, we tell these stories to ourselves about what we're really doing when in reality we're tied to that relationship because we also get a sense of self-worth from being the helper, from being the martyr, from being the one that you know is saving the person and yes that is not healthy um, and it's complicated you know because intermixed in that can be uh, an unconditional love um, but it's just tied in so much with ego that it that it's not coming through clean in a clean way and um, because of that it can't really um, be um, healing um, for yourself or really for the other pe person ultimately um, so anyway that's what I have to say about um, unconditional love versus codependency and I'm gonna do another video at some point talking about um, the difference between ego uh, fear and intuitive fear so um, have a good day I hope that was enlightening if you have any questions for me personally or about something I've said or you have comments observations um, please get a hold of me, um, either leave a comment on the video or message me, whatever. Um, I'd like to keep this communication open. Um, it's a really important topic, and I love you guys. Um, see you later.